So we've been collecting data on the ancient world for several centuries. We actually have to research the data that other people have collected about the data um, a lot of the time. But I will start with something which will remind you what we're talking about today. That, f that image, I don't need to explain why that image is important. It is a photograph which was taken in October 1918. And it's a very good example of the kind of thing which happens with data. You collect them for one reason, but once you have your data and let them out, they gallop around the world doing all sorts of other things you didn't expect them to do. They behave. You are never going to know what somebody else will do with the thing that you have recorded. It's a really important truth for, for, for all of us working with data in any kind of way. I think the significance of this photograph, which was undoubtedly taken for military reasons. What they're interested in here is the barracks at the top of the photograph. Um, this is the Australian Flying Corps. They don't, had no way of realising how valuable records like this are going to be, particularly, I mean, this very day, uh, this is a very significant moment just around this image. So our data, so things that seem often quite static, develop a life of their own and you never know when they're going to, what they're going to do next, where they're going to jump to next, what's going to be required. Um, the interesting thing about uh, the, pu the public domain, I, uh, teaching uh, over many years uh, the classical past, what you learnt was that students' knowledge of geography shifted with current affairs. So they, only, they know only about the geography of the bits of the world where something's happening that's on the news. And at the moment, um, this arc of, of locations, which were important in the first millennium BC, are again very important at the moment. You, we're seeing lots and lots and lots of maps of northern Syria and northern Iraq as they currently are. And you will see that uh, that map had some, has had some current borders put onto it. Um, in fact, this has been an important area of, of both uh, civilization and frequent conflict over millennia. And one of the places, uh, there is Aleppo, and there is a place where a very major battle fought at Carchemish in 650 BC. Carchemish is an important, is currently on just on the Turkish side of the Turkish Syrian border. And my colleagues and colleagues in Italy have recently started reopened the excavations there. The early excavations were in the early 20th century. And there you have two of the important excavators, uh, Leonard Woolley, who, whose work you will see if they go to the British Museum, and T.E. Lawrence. That's a reminder that I also showed you this because I work on inscribed stones and I like to show people inscribed stones. But the point about the interesting thing there is a reminder how Lawrence, who was to become known as Lawrence of Arabia, who was to be an agent of the British government in, during the First World War, the reason he was a useful agent was because of the experience that he acquired as an archaeologist, because if you are an archaeologist, you go to the actual place and you walk around on the actual hills. And it's noticeable that in the First World War, the, the Allies had very few maps of the Middle East, reliable maps, because very few people had travelled in, inland 
the British had lots of stuff about the coast, um, except for archaeologists. So the best map, Kiepert's archaeological maps of Asia Minor, were crucial and were used in the War Office uh, in Manchester Square. They had them pinned out on, on tables and they were drawing the modern situation on these archaeological maps because they were actually pretty accurate maps. Uh, so there's been a sort of interplay. The view that all archaeologists are spies, which naturally developed after the First World War, is, is, is rather like a lot of stuff about people we call spies. Archaeologists are people who've got to know the place. And who've got to know the place in a kind of proximity that most people don't. So they contribute a very special kind of data, a very granular localized data but they, and they can also use what uh, use photographs like the one of Aleppo. Um, the, this preoccupation with place, I'll just take you back quickly because I, it's an interesting period, is 1878 when it was decided how the Middle East was to be sorted out. didn't last for very long but um, that map of how Eastern Europe was supposed to be in 1878, quite useful to remind oneself that it used to look like that, um, required somebody to do the mapping. And here you have this rather the same kind of thing. The man sent to do the mapping, Sir Charles Wilson, did ordnance survey work for the British, for the, for the engineers in, in Jerusalem, Scotland, other, you know, other difficult areas, um, so Jerusalem, Scotland, Sinai and Ireland. And while he was working in Jerusalem, he kept on running into archaeology. Couldn't miss it. And upon leaving the Ordnance Survey, he became one of the founder members of an archaeological organization called the Palestine Exploration Society, which led a lot of excavations and is still flourishing to this day. How do you divide your data up and say, that's archaeology and that's useful for ordnance? Um, and just rather pleasingly, when he was surveying the American, he was invited to create the border between the USA and Canada, an ever more sensitive area, and he, it's nice to see what he wore to do it in. But that's just a side. It's a reminder that boundaries are, somebody has actually walked and said, this is here and that is there. Um, another parallel, of course, to Gertrude to, to T. Lawrence is Gertrude Bell, who also worked as an archaeologist in Asia Minor, in what is now Syria and what is now Iraq, and was famously, one might even say notoriously, involved in advising the British government on how the Middle East should be sliced up after the First World War, after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. And we're living with the consequences of conversations of that kind it, to this day. Uh, Lawrence, of course, uh, it, after his campaigns, was also involved in uh, advising the British government. And you probably know this famous map, which is the Imperial War Museum, of his proposals for how the boundaries should be drawn. They, he didn't take the oil into account and they were of no real interest to the British government. Uh, instead, in 1920, that's the proposed map of Turkey, which is worth thinking about. The Turks did get a little bit in the middle they were going to have, and everybody else was going to slice it up. Um, that led to war, and so, Two years later, that's what the Turks had. Maps and mapping are one of the most fundamental forms of shared data, of data that we use for a whole range of different things. And in the digital world, it's very interesting to see how the establishment of accurate mapping data is starting to pull together subjects and concerns that used to live very separately from one another. And I think that's one of the really interesting things that's happening in the media at the moment. Um, the implications of the First World War and of photographs like that one of Aleppo were not lost 
on the archaeologists. And the several centers for surveying archaeological sites were developed after the First World War. Um, one of the most famous of which, uh, well, the, the, the center, the main center in England was in Cambridge. Um, there are others um, in other parts of the world. And uh, it was in Cambridge, they now have a wonderful collection of archaeological photographs. And of course, nowadays, that kind of thing is done very, very carefully and with a great deal of scrutiny of people. Above all, you had to learn how to read the photographs. And what you find, um, they learned a great deal more in the Second World War, when what they were scrutinizing was photographs of bombed cities to work out what they'd achieved, what they'd actually achieved. So every night, you would be going through those photographs, working out whether you'd actually hit the railway station. Those, that, that, that whole approach is, it, is archaeological, really, and was easily transferred to archaeology. And the current records, I can't recommend too strongly, it's one, the wonderful website that all sitting on Flickr, which has been accumulated for archaeology. Uh, this archive is largely for the Middle East. There's a, an associated thing for North, North Africa. Um, they've, people have been accumulating this material. And of course, like the photograph of Aleppo, it's now in itself historic material. It's already rec it's records of things which have gone and are disappearing very, very fast. Um, I would now see what really interests me. I work on Greek inscriptions in Libya. Um, uh, I work on Greek inscriptions and I'm currently working on a corpus of material from Libya. And uh, one of the, with a, my 97-year-old colleague, uh, who's been collecting this material for the last 60 years, um, had a good deal, was always challenged by the fact that it was very, very difficult to get maps of Gaddafi's Libya. Um, in fact, when I started in archaeology, it was difficult to get maps of anywhere in the Middle East um, because there was no Google Earth. A map was something that a government could control and lock up and put away in a safe and you could be prosecuted for owning maps of too helpful a scale. It's really, it's one of those sea changes that it's hard to get your head around really. So when my colleague first published her inscriptions from Libya in 1952, she had very, very unsatisfactory hand-drawn maps. And one of the things that irritated her most was not being able to put places on a proper map. When we republished this online in 2009, we were, it was part of a project to develop uh, ancient world mapping. And that led us to, with the data we'd collected, to start recording heritage evidence for heritage locations in Libya. Um, when the American bombing of Libya was being prepared, um, <laughs> there was, um, you could probably use that as a timing mechanism, um, <laughs> you just need to find out what their timetable is. Um, when the American bombers, bombing was being prepared, after the nasty experience the Americans had had in Iraq, of doing, getting it all slightly wrong, um, they were extremely alert to the implications of another bombing campaign. They got in touch with an American colleague of mine with whom we'd worked on the Tripolitania thing and picked up as many coordinates as we could give them for, the, for sites in Libya. And a colleague of mine who went out afterwards to inspect war damage in Libya with, with an organization, an international organization called the Blue Shield, said that actually the targeting had been remarkably precise, and that actually virtually nothing was damaged by, uh, the, by, the, uh, war, by the bombing, uh, because they've got all these lovely toys nowadays, and as long as you give them the data. So that was an interesting example of the kind of circles that data go round in. It never occurred to us, we wanted to know where our inscriptions were. It never occurred to us 
that that data would be useful to them any more than it had occurred to those photographers in 1918 that that information would be useful to archaeologists. You don't know where your data are going to go. You don't know what it's for. The only thing you can do is try to make sure that it's of the highest qu possible quality. Now, with the Libyan material, we have been quite challenged because there is um, a lot of it we just acquired, uh, worked, worked on images in Google Earth, getting our coordinates from that. But still, there are, I, we've now, we're building up this gazetteer, and what I'm finding is that you get locations with some very, very variant coordinates, particularly out in the desert. People have gone out with a funny bit of kit and recorded as be the best they could. It's better than nothing. But what we're trying to build now is a resource which uh, people studying Libya, but above all our colleagues in Libya, can use as they undertake the laborious task of looking after the heritage of what is in fact an extremely um, rich and important country. Um, as you can see, uh, places have a million names, just for starters, uh, and finding out a lot of those, a lot of the names reflect what a foreign visitor thinks the person was saying when he asked what is the name of this place. It makes a very big difference whether that foreign visitor was Italian, as they were for quite some time, or British, or something else. So you have to kind of decode information which has already been through funny linguistic filters before it reaches you. But our duty, as I say, our duty is to collect as much detailed as information as we can, record it, make it public, and make it possible for people to add to it and to improve it. So that the aim is that our data should get better and better. That's, that's what we want to achieve. The, the damage of the, from the bombing in Libya was relatively limited. The post-conflict damage has been much more substantial. The, the most targeted uh, monuments have been not the monument, the Greco-Roman monuments, which I study. Um, they have been, the deliberately targeted monuments have mostly been Islamic monuments considered to, to, considered to be um, related to some heretical, some text, some sect which somebody else considers is heretical, heretical. So there's been a lot of loss of medieval, of Libya's medieval heritage. That's just being, that's being deliberately knocked down. Um, what's more common is uh, people digging holes to see what they might find. Uh, and quite a lot of stuff is coming out on the art market. Um, or these very, very important historic, prehistoric graffiti. Uh, well, you can see behind there are figures there. It's a very important, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and people just going scrawling graffiti. In fact, if they only scrawl with paint, that's not too much of a problem. It's, it's not the worst kind of thing that could happen. And perhaps the most insidious thing is this. My friend from, a uh, friend on the Libyan delegation uh, for, to UNESCO sent me that one. It's just encroachment. It's, I want to put up a building and there is absolutely nobody to stop me. Um, that's, so where do data come in here? Well, um, all righty. Here is the city of Massa, and up there is the location. This is a you know a few days ago Google, uh, the location of a re pe big piece of redevelopment. 
Um, luckily with Google, with Google Earth, that you can see earlier images. That's where the redevelopment was, has taken place. Underneath it are the traces of an ancient city, which ha was the property of the Antiquities Department, but there is at the moment no authority to ensure that that kind of thing is respected. In fact, I heard quite an interesting, we had a meeting about this at King's very recently, and somebody was describing how the chap just came in with his, um, his thing for pushing earth, uh, his caterpillar, his JCB, um, and said, this is mine and none of you are going to report this. And if you do, yeah, but you know what's going to happen. But the good thing about this form of data is that actually there are records. There are records, and, we, and they are not records which you can just go in and burn and get rid of. There are records which are diffused worldwide. When we see the damage in Aleppo, we will be able to identify what the things are that have been damaged because we have the data. And I think the uses of data for, as, for preserving, not just from bombing, but from day-to-day -day attrition of cultural heritage, are really, really important. And the pressure of development pressure is by no means limited to war-torn areas, as we all know. Development pressure on cultural heritage is a worldwide phenomenon which we're all dealing with, whether it's you know, the Dakota pipeline, or whether it's central London, or whether it's Libya, or whether it's Syria. It's happening everywhere. Everyone wants to push this stuff aside, and it's very, once it's gone, it's gone. And therefore, there's a real function for data as documentation to give strength to the authorities who look after this stuff. But there's one more question which I want to ask you. We're publishing our gazetteer. Um, yeah, I'll go back to it. Uh, we're publishing our gazetteer of locations. And we're putting it all out. We published on the 1st of October. We're putting it all out openly online. We're adding more and more information. We're saying there's a Roman villa here, or there's a location there, or whatever. But is there, oh yes, I think I included that slide. I did, I think. Yes. Is it a good idea to publish this information? What are the risks involved? There's a, site, there's, a, there's a site in Oxford, there's a research project in Oxford to collect information about religious sites from all religions in Syria. They've started obscuring their data information because do you want to tell people about the, the precise location of a synagogue in central Syria? What are you doing by doing that? Now, my commitment has always been to the publication of totally open data. All of this data could be extracted from printed books. Surely, it is our duty to put everything out there, to make everything accurate and available. But should we actually be giving accurate coordinates? I, I don't know the answer to that. We, uh, we treated the Americans as a benign power when we gave them the data. We assumed that they wanted this data so as not to destroy the monuments. And I think that's probably true, because there wasn't much gain to them in de destroying them. But who, what happens when you let your data go? Lots of people use it in lots and lots of ways, and they're not all benign. So that would be my question to you. How we talk about our own data being safe, don't we? Protecting ourselves, keeping our, pri our data private, all of that. What about this? This is public, this is world heritage stuff. 
what are our duties to World Heritage data? So that's my question to you. Right. Thank you very much.